we're fun this way. <laughs> you have a wicked sense of humor. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. So I'm gonna get going here. Um, good evening, I'm Dave Lennox, University Architect and Director of Campus Planning and Design here at Stanford. And I wanna welcome everybody to the fourth lecture of our 2021 Architecture, Landscape, Urban Design Spring Lecture Series. The theme of this year's lecture is the public realm. The Bay Area is one of the many urban regions struggling with transportation and housing crises resulting in a glaring socioeconomic divide and greater physical segregation. Yet research has shown us that the more we engage with people who are different from us, the more creative we become. A diverse community is better equipped to develop successful solutions to complex problems that fuel evolution. And cities are truly the incubators of innovation and the public realm is the great mixing chamber where new ideas are conceived. We are honored to have such outstanding professionals join us this spring to reflect on the significance of the public realm in their design approach and their body of work. Now, before we begin, I wanna thank our moderator tonight, Zach Posner, Director of Architecture, John Barton, the Director of the Stanford Architectural Design Program, as well as Padma Kudetipudi and Diana Lin for organizing the series. I'd also like to thank the American Institute of Architects Silicon Valley chapter for their help in advertising this series and registering our program for continuing professional education. And at the end of the lecture, your attendance will be automatically noted and submitted to the AIA. Our next lecture is on Thursday, June 2nd, about two weeks and a day. And we're pleased to have Laura Cresciamano from SiteLab Urban Studio. It will be held virtually via Zoom webinar, just like tonight. So a little protocol for today's webinar, please use your Q&A section to post any questions you may have during the lecture. We've uh, allocated about 10 minutes at the end of the lecture for Q&A and our moderator, Zach, will group similar questions together and present them to the speaker as time permits. So thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Julie Eisenberg. Julie Eisenberg, FAIA and LFAIA Australia is a founding principal of Koning Eisenberg and own, uh, holds a Bachelor's of Architecture, an honorary doctorate from the University of Melbourne, Australia, and a Master's of Architecture from UCLA. She brings design vision, leadership and expertise in working with cities, nonprofit agencies, institutions, and private developers to generate inventive master plans in public places. Julie is an astute observer leading investigations that reshape the way we think about conventional building typologies. Her focus on the user experience, whether as an individual underserved community or public at large, brings an empathetic perspective that translates seemingly mundane programs into places of ease and generosity. Julie teaches and lectures around the world, currently serves on the boards of Public Architecture, the School of Architecture at Taliesin, and FYI from Youth Inside Film. Her most recent book titled Urban Hallucinations offers more insight into the philosophy and work of a practice that aligns humanist values with inventive architectural form making. Under her leadership, Koning Eisenberg has earned over 160 design and sustainability awards and has been widely published. The practice has been honored as AIA California's firm of the year. And she and founding partner Hank Koning were awarded the 2019 Australia Institute of Architects Gold Medal and the 2012 AIA Los Angeles Gold Medal in recognition of a lasting influence on the theory and practice of architecture. So tonight, we are very privileged to have Julie with us. And I want to have us all please offer her a warm, but albeit virtual, Stanford welcome. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Nice to see you all. I'm going to share a screen now. So just to check that you're in the right lecture series, here we are at the public room, which is, uh, I mean, great company, some interesting people, and I should join the rest of your series and, and listen in. So let's get going. Aha, uh -huh. 
The slides are not advancing. So it's okay. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about neighborhood. My neighborhood is down south in Los Angeles and Los Angeles is filling in. Not fast enough for all and too fast for many. Developments being propelled by an acute shortage of housing, which I know you're experiencing up north and also by an improvement to transportation infrastructure. So neighborhoods start with homes for all. In our little publication, uh, Urban Hallucinations, that uh, David mentioned, we started looking at neighborhood in sort of more detail. And I've extracted from that a little bit on post-war housing typologies to give a context of what neighborhood feels like. So we're gonna start with dingbats, move to six packs, and then go to single and double podiums. So post-war housing is basically formed from the intersection of money, planning codes, and limits of wood frame construction in a seismic zone. I don't have to talk to you about seismic, you understand it better than I do. Start with dingbats, you know these when I show you the picture. They were the first sort of uh, expedient model that came out post-war. And what was also happening post-war was the introduction of the car. So what you have here is a, um, uh, a quick and easy way to get a permit, takes advantage of the buy right limits of the site, and builds as much square footage as possible. Six packs, they're a feature of the 80s and they're called six packs because they're two layers of parking generally with four layers of wood frame construction above divided by a concrete podium. Six packs look like this. Not all that attractive, and, but they are sli uh, sly. Uh, the LA building, uh, sorry, planning code had a strange little exception that if your first level was partially submerged, you still met the four levels uh, height limit. So these, these buildings that kept the parking outside um, above the gray saved a lot of money for the developers and sort of uh, got the reputation of showing uh, cars in jail. So there you have it same, you get the, the rule, it's the same set of rules as, as the small lot, but they generally combine larger lots. And they're generally developed on residential properties. You can see a modern version to the right, but they built to the limit. They didn't care too much about the neighbors and they generally made an internalized social space. Podiums, podiums came into their own in the 1990s as a lot of uh, boulevard real estate was rezoned to uh, allow for housing. So what you have is parking now underground because the real estate's got more expensive and the regulations about parking have got more demanding. The two orange levels are generally retail and maybe a parking floor above that. But over more recent times, they've actually can even be residential. And then you have the ability to build five levels of wood frame above. And they look like this. Now here you see the other kicking in part. So the planning zoning, planning regulations gave us space for more cars, which wasn't all that great. And then the community pushed back, not about the cars, they still actually want the cars, but about the scale of the developments. So this is what I kind of call the collage massing. I don't understand why communities bought it because it's not very convincing to me. And there's multiple, multiple iterations of this kind of development. Same deal, but with the exacerbated condition that they actually are located next to a very abrupt division to lower, lower height zoned areas. Don't get me wrong, I have no problem with height. Um, I'd like to be taller. So here we go. Here's LA, it's a picturesque picture postcard view. But on the street, the LA neighborhood look more like this. And we got to believe that there's a better way to think about how home and street and the space between me. For that, I'll take you to Santa Monica, which is uh, my home, well, my hometown now. I was born in Australia, but here I am in Santa Monica. And the expo line, I hope you can see my cursor, 
came to Santa Monica in 2016. Um, and that precipitated the development of 500 Broadway. And as you can see, 500 Broadway is pretty close to the beach and close to shopping and uh, pier and a lot of amenity uh, that uh, are around there. 500 Broadway is being built in the context of a, an aware city that uh, are demanding on sustainability. It's a lead platinum project um, to, to have the right to build and conforms with other control that you see down there. Uh, Santa Monica still needs to get smart like uh, San Francisco about the car, but they're getting better. The other thing that Santa Monica is progressive about is affordable housing. So if you want to develop market rate housing, and this is 250 units at around, uh, I think it's 130 units per acre, you need to be able to build 20% of that number as affordable housing. And in this case, the affordable housing is built in the sister project, the Arroyo. The city's smart. You can't build your affordable housing five miles down the road. You have to build, build it within a five minute radius so it has the benefit of the same services that the sponsoring project does. But it's been a, a help in sponsoring new affordable housing. The Arroyo also is lead platinum. So let's talk about another sort of framework about the building. Um, in our office, we started talking about it as sort of sticky space thinking. It's a term my partner, Nathan Bishop, came up with. And it's really about making this kind of closer connection between home and the street. So what it does is instead of courtyard housing, which creates a wall to the street and an inner courtyard, this is four blocks with cross grain massing that allows breezes to move through beyond the building and provides views to neighbors beyond. It also starts to erode the separation between housing and uh, ground level uses. And that was a really deliberate attempt to try and connect street life with home life. Uh, we're in construction on that. And I do confess that it doesn't conform to the, the cheap prototype. It actually has a moment frame construction. Back in that time, you could not do wood frame construction for this height of building with a rooftop where you had uh, community activities. Long story and you don't want to go into it. But uh, the, the prefabricated moment frame saves a lot of time in construction. Which brings us back to the Arroyo, which you saw in the opening shot. So the Arroyo, given the budgets for affordable housing, is crafted embracing sticky space principles within the limitations of cost-conscious wood frame construction, using minimal secondary moves to animate massing configured to encourage social interaction. Uh, the residents here are large families. And the game is, what can you do that makes a difference with minimal means? A gestural angle, shading that provides amenity and ornament. For us, sustainability had the best uh, reward when you could, uh, add, you could legitimize adding a sunshade uh, and get the extra ornament as well as the, um, the sustainable benefit. A rippling rather than static grid approach to window placement that, that uh, evokes the history of the site. So for those of you who are in the architecture game itself, um, we've been doing a lot of architecture lately, which is about veils of things. When you get to the economy of housing, it really has a discipline about how you do the cutout opening. And that's really interesting because within that parameter, you start to look for nuanced ways that you can do something. Well, the site was an arroyo, a dry bed in the summer and uh, coursing water in the winter. The the, there was an original train track. It was built around 1909 and uh, goes through the site, which I think is probably covered by pictures of me and other important people um, on, the, on the right. And uh, what's interesting about that is that that was dismantled in the 50s. So that expo station I showed you in the slide with 500 Broadway, returned to Santa Monica 2016. So there was a big gap. Yes, and of course the 60s came and then all water needed to be contained in, uh, in a more controlled system and you get nine foot stormwater drains, which runs right down the center of the site. For our purposes, this was not a bad thing 
because one, it meant the site was cheaper because the parking for affordable housing is, uh, requires less parking than a site for market rate housing. And it allowed us to build, to, sorry, to plant trees on grade uh, in the ground around the, uh, the stormwater drain, which is, follows sort of the concrete in, in that area. And that's a great thing. So designing for, uh, for families and who are trying to build a community together is all about how you use the outdoor space in our kind of climate. And a lot of time was spent planning that, uh, that Arroyo garden space and how it could be used. In a more upmarket uh, uh, facility, it would be more about what the view is. Um, when it's families with young children who are struggling to stabilize, it's all about how you can share things and uh, get, uh, gain sort of a mutual support system, which is actually why the building was split off from the, uh, the larger project. Because I'm sure some of you are saying, well, that's terrible. I mean, if we're talking about inclusivity, why isn't everyone living together? Actually, it was the affordable housing developer who said, we have a need for large family housing and when the income is too low, and I think this is about 30 to 60% or maybe, maybe less mean, uh, mean county income, um, they don't mix well in uh, the, the, a larger, broader community with more disposable money. And they said, look, they need a supportive community. We want a separate site. The benefit of the separate site was easier funding as well. And that allowed us to also build uh, community spaces that provided homework rooms and activity spaces for the residents. So if we're talking about sticky space, sticky space is a resonant idea. It means if you take something, you give something. So the gap in the building with the trees starts to create a space that gives back a borrowed landscape to the street as this Lincoln Boulevard, if any, any of you know it, is densifying at an extremely fast rate. And then there's a way you use your money to uh, do the most effect to make a social connection. So to provide life safety egress, you, re you require fire stairs. You all know what those are, those are in your buildings. But you can also minimize the amount of fire stairs you use, which means you use less money for stairs and build bridges instead, because you make loops, which allow people ways to get in and out in, in, in a different way. And that creates a three-dimensional connection between people at upper levels and people moving through the space below. Everything, what, what's wonderful about the affordable housing is not just that you get to work with four people who really get a kick out of having a roof over their heads and feeling like they're, they're, you know, they're valued and they can get their lives back together, but it's also that you get to play this game about minimal moves which is incredibly interesting. And you can see the undercroft there next to the basketball, which provides some covered outdoor space as well as the um, garden space as well. So those are the, my uh, little sunshades. And we're gonna go down. Oh, we're not gonna go downtown. Got my order wrong, hey. We're gonna go to the Ashland Apartments. Now, I've been to Palo Alto, and the density of apartments is not like the Arroyo and the, um, and the 500. It's more like the Ashland scale apartments. But these kind of scales, like 30 units per acre, maybe 50 units per acre, are missing in the LA area. And what's problematic about that is that there's no intermediate uh, housing for people with young families, predominantly, that would get a benefit of out of outdoor space. So if a normal house is uh, 50 by 150, a quarter acre lot, and this is 30 units per acre, you can understand that relatively, this is a lot cheaper. So we need to do, be able to do more of this kind of thing. And uh, so what we've got with Lincoln Boulevard still on the left, let me see if my cursor gets you over there. Here you go. Lincoln Boulevard, and if you go up the road, you'll find the Arroyo. There's a big drop in the, uh, the terrain here, and there's a big building being built on this site. This is a funny little lot that we have here because it's a flag lot. Maybe it'll come up next. 
um, which will actually be blocked. So there's the driveway coming in on the left. Oops, here we go. On the left, coming under the building. And what we did is we made all of the units have gardens. We did a trade. The disabled accessible units are on the ground floor at the entry level. And that means um, that we didn't need an elevator to the upper levels. The money saved allowed us to convince or work with the developer to say, okay, we can do more exterior wall, which means that we can give a sense of um, house, houses rather than housing or apartments. And that was greatly appealing to the neighbors because on three sides we're surrounded by uh, single family housing. And so that's where the uh, building on Lincoln Boulevard, that's the height that it will be. So there's the site, you can see the flag lot. You can, you can also see, I'm having trouble with my cursor. Here we go. You can see the flag lot. You can see the way the units on that ground level uh, mediate uh, the parking and that the open planning above and then on the far, on the second floor, which I think might be screened for some of you, um, you can see how the townhouses play out. It's Santa Monica. They had 10 units. They were required to provide one affordable unit. And I, the, in this case, you can't tell which is which. And I actually think the affordable unit is this one here, which is a townhouse exactly the same as this one. And that those small openings, and we always think we're meant to make sensible openings. It's not that. It's you meant to make openings between things that are gestural that suggest beauty that, uh, the challenge the senses that make a great ex experience. And we were able to do that here with very minimal means. And again, we we're on at the issue of doing it cheaply. So all of the openings are cut out, right? We have sheer walls. So the more wall we can provide, the better. And I guess the inspiration was the, uh, the old uh, California courtyard housing that uh, Schindler and uh, Irving Gilded. And then to come through a community courtyard through a front yard to your front door. Um, the little gimmick, I guess, would be the orange screens, which are insect screens, which gave us the idea of a customization at a very small ad price uh, to very normative uh, building components. And now we go downtown. And the desperation of the homeless issue is, uh, well, you know it as much as I do, it's, it's tough, it's tough to watch. And this building that you're looking at is the building that we just finished called Floor. Uh, it's on Flower Street. Uh, it's, sorry, it's on Wall Street in the Flower District, just on the edge of Skid Row. And the need is so urgent that it, is, it was at this time surrounded by homeless housing in tents. And we can't get the stuff out fast enough. And again, in terms of the composition, you might say, well, the need is so big, so why are you worrying about all the details? because this building will be there for a while. It's permanent housing, which is part of what we need to build as an inventory, as we also address the emergency shelter that's needed. And uh, it looks like this, and you can see different strategies that we're using to manipulate the surface at uh, very little incremental cost. And the idea again of a shared garden gives back to the street while it creates a, rest, a green respite uh, in the city. So we're in a pretty dense urban area, pretty gritty urban area, and the trees are little. And believe it or not, we, we had to convince the city that they should plant street trees as well. So it's kind of a funny little juxtaposition of things that uh, you do to try and create the most benefit for the people that you're building for. So the front, uh, the front door, Again, the idea of being secure, but sort of the, the fear that you're going to make people feel like it's, uh, it's not welcoming. And as you come through the entrance, that you can see activity and people. If you go straight ahead on the little photos on the right, you would end up at on-site social services, which is a hugely important part of stabilizing lives. And this housing is specifically designed to be supportive housing as a sort of a as a first permanent place off the street. And for those with mental illness uh, and uh, with preference for vets. 
And again, you saw the bridges and the sort of the circulation path. And you've got an architect up north called David Baker who started talking about circulation as being a way to um, encourage informal exercise. And we thought that was brilliant. It's also circulation, if you plan it well, is a way of sort of encouraging informal social interaction, which is great for people who are trying to find a, a place in, in a hostile world. So you come up to that uh, second level courtyard, where, which is the hub of activities, social services below, um, activities and workshops here. And looking back out from one of the lounges. And then looking back down from above, um, I want to come back to you in about a year and show you uh, the landscaping grown in. But these strategies are um, effective and they, they look easier to pull off than they actually are. And I'm not complaining, but um, affordable housing takes as much discipline to do well as any other building type. Uh, single loaded, you get um, every, every sort of, what do you call, queue that we can make that people are welcome to sit or have some control, a movable chair is a big deal. Which brings us to community resources. So I'd say that the neighborhood library is emblematic of the idea of a community resource offering access and opportunity for all. Three projects that explore the idea of the library follow, starting in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we're flying over the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh, which is a domed building with the addition that we did in between. The Children's Museum take back abandoned spaces like the planetarium and the plaza in the foreground and uh, fill them with program for children and families. They believe that this kind of investment in disinvested neighborhoods brings the neighborhood back. And I agree with them. Well, you won't be surprised that the first Allegheny Library, which you're seeing now that we're zooming over, uh, was shuttered and the Children's Museum gained control and decided to put in more programming for children. Well, actually teens. So let me, uh, hold on, I've got, I've got to catch up with myself. Uh, whoa, my notes are here, but my head is not. Here we go. The library was the first of the Carnegie Public Libraries commissioned through an endowment set up by steel magnate and industrialist Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was an immigrant who believed access to knowledge, hard work and merit got you places. At that time, books were the pathway to knowledge. The earliest public neighborhood libraries like this one housed books in closed structural stacks. Books were expensive, protected and revered. The architecture reflected that. Reading rooms were quiet, serious places where people sat upright. Fast forward 100 plus years and the library was empty and distressed and the Children's Museum saw it as a resource to expand their programming. So here we are in its reincarnation as the museum lab. It brought the library back to life and it is an ambitious project for 10 to 14 year olds that includes studios for art, technology and fabrication, a charter Title I middle school for 140 children, partners like Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh who facilitate innovative technologies and analyze the potential of this collaboration between informal museum and formal school learning environments. The hope is to create a new paradigm for learning. They're way more ambitious than I am with a, with a building design. So here are the plans. From an architectural point of view, the real key sounds pathetic, but the real key was getting the elevator in the right place. And that elevator is located back here. That allowed us to connect all floors. Um, the blue space is new space. On the first floor, the new space is filling in structural stacks to make a uh, program space. On the upper floor, it fills in a light well where the elevator connects to this, the, uh, the charter school through a, a large gathering space and then up 
which, oh boy, it's blocked in my photograph, but on the far right, you'll see a mezzanine space, which is called the assembly hall. So let me sort of show you that in section. So there's the light well, which is with the new gathering space, which is skylit, uh, front door over here, coming through the entry to what was a delivery room, which is where you would go and ask for your books, now called the Grable Gallery. Below is partner space for sort of co-working space for people in the nonprofit education business. Um, the charter school is reached through here and there's a lounge sort of in front of us there. We love working with the Children's Museum because they allow for exploration. So when we got there, we were hoping to take this national register of historic places building to redeem some of the inside. We knew it had been too damaged to be considered historic, but we figured that the historic bones were still there. When we started uh, doing discovery, we realized that the work that had been done in a 60s remodel had sliced through column capitals and had encapsulated plaster, which was now crumbling away. So the plan had to change. In the end, to get to a stable surface, given the crumbling mortar and sliced capitals, we had to strip back to the structural underpinnings, load-bearing brick and steel armatures. These were poetic and a fitting backdrop for a program that looked at how things are made in a building endowed by a steel magnet. We embraced the idea of a beautiful ruin. Behind is this perforated metal screen um, to the new stair, and that's made from salvaged material from the structural library stacks. Flooring was repurposed as bench, uh, uh, old uh, stack flooring, which was wood, was repurposed as benches and uh, other features. And there's so much beauty. And then the museum believes that art is, is part of their agenda. So what happens is they buy pieces and they commission pieces, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. So the Grable Gallery, which was the delivery room, looked like this. And as Discovery went through, you can see the damaged uh, uh, building that we found. And then here you see the fabulous uh, commission uh, installation by Friedman Bach, um, whose uh, cut fabric piece uh, evokes the old Tiffany glass ceiling that used to brace the delivery room ceiling. But you can't just do this stuff without a sort of a framework. We needed rules of engagement. So we declared different kinds of finishes, preservation areas. They revealed all and were repaired only to avoid distracting gashes and to seal uh, the surface. Faux rest restoration areas. These were cleaned up and paint extended to camouflage needed modern interventions like interior insulation, which was added to exterior walls to improve energy performance. And then I have a fun fact for you because today I was doing some research and one, I was looking up the sustainability report on this building and the uh, sustainability consultants estimated that keeping and adaptive reusing this steel and masonry building uh, mitigated 5,400 metric tons of CO2 equivalent to the carbon sequestered annually in a 7,000 acre forest. So think carefully before you pull things down. Um, so to distinguish between what was what, we created distinct cut lines that you see here. Preservation, faux restoration. Looking back through the Grable Gallery, some of the program spaces. And then upstairs to the second floor, that's the light well we enclosed it, I showed you in the section. And then just in front of that light well was a sort of a lobby lounge area that actually had toilets installed, which completely blocked all of the glazing. They were removed and now it looks like this. Some of the furniture you see was retrieved from the uh, Pittsburgh uh, repository, uh, library repository who were glad that someone could uh, take the furniture off their hands. We opened the arches down to the ground to get more continuity into the new gathering space. 
To the left is the entrance of Charter School. Which operates independently, but takes advantage of all the programming that the children's muse uh, that the uh, museum lab offers. Also, a great bunch of uh, incredible educators, and the assembly hall at the top. So, generally, when you do these spaces that are flex spaces, you end up feeling like you're sitting in a room that's really meant for storage that happens to be used by a group of people because there are stacks of chairs lying around. So in this case, uh, we took the chairs and we got some great orange hooks from uh, Home Depot. And this says the chairs hang on the wall so that in any configuration, it always looks like the space is meant for people, not for chairs. Looking back, And I forgot to show you that, um, just one thing, I'll just forget, where did it go? Here you go. I forgot to point out. So the light comes through the skylight, and then that, those two kids are standing on a glass floor, and that glass floor filters light down onto uh, the Grable Gallery uh, uh, art installation. It's a project that we're really proud of. It got, uh, you know, it got, terminated for a while because of COVID and it had just been getting up and running. And everything about the working with the Children's Museum was an exploration. They were exploring program, but we were exploring architecture and uh, it was wonderful. And it was a great team to work with. Um, the final uh, discovery was all of this terracotta in the entranceway that was buried beneath a blue plaster coat and uh, yeah we we had to spend a little money getting that done even though it was more money than anyone wanted to spend which brings us to the pico branch library so nowadays a neighborhood library is much more informal than in carnegie's day reaching the public in the digital age means creating social energy and offering choice as much as books this library was added to a six acre park that we had designed some 10 years earlier. The work had reconnected the predominantly Hispanic and African-American families living in the apartments to the north with the gentrifying predominantly white single family housing to the south. And it took back the park, which was gang turf that lay between. We built trust through that interactive public design process and through the park's success. And they asked us back to design the library. The same community who pushed to add a library to the park stayed in, uh, who, who pushed for the park, pushed for the library, and they stayed involved in the process. They wanted, and this was a public uh, design process, which was just great, um, a family-friendly, not so quiet library, because what they were worried about was kids, mainly from second, uh, second language, where English was a second language, there was a lagging student achievement gap. And they wanted this library to help get literacy front and forward and get kids to read earlier and uh, have a better shot at, uh, at an education and a choice. So a library for them and for us was a not so quiet library that attracted kids and families that was informal and felt like a family living room, their words. The more activities in immediate relationship, the more choice, and the more families likely to include a visit to the library in a set of activities. While we were in, uh, and while we were at it, that same group of people said, don't you dare take any of that green space you already gave us away. So we looked for a place to put the library that didn't do that. We could fit the reading room um, on the, at the end of the uh, Saturday Farmer's Market, which was a great sort of collision of, of of energy, um, but we couldn't also fit the community uh, community room. Building a second story was prohibitively expensive. We came up with the idea of building that the community room across the fire lane. Uh, what 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 we thought was a liability was converted to an opportunity because it gave us an uh, uh, 
the opportunity, I guess, I'll have to use the same word again, um, the opportunity to pump up the presence of the library and the walkway that goes north, south through the park. And you'll see that in coming photos. The other part about this design was it was designed to be lead platinum and it was designed, and I can show you the little diagrams to prove all that sort of stuff. Um, it was designed to be, to integrate light. So in a library, you don't want direct sunlight, but you do want to be able to see in and you do want to see out, especially in a library that was designed to, to get energy from that sticky space kind of interaction of being connected to other things. So to make something visible in, you actually have to bring light into the library, hence the skylights. The overhangs needed to be large so you didn't have direct sun coming into the building. So I'll kind of walk you through. So there's the walkway um, that uh, the photovoltaic span uh, to join the community room to the reading room and what it feels to be under there. Again, this issue of sun being a free ornament a gift if you use uh, shadows as part of your uh, toolbox. Um, and then very informal gestures. So these were part of the architecture, not part of the farmer's market, but we're sort of the mediator. So soft cloth uh, stretched awnings uh, that shade the library. Through the front door. Um, the sense of well being and aspiration that a little architecture can give you. Those strong connections inside to out. They all work together. And uh, to do good architecture doesn't mean that you don't, don't do kind buildings. A lot of discussion about access to uh, the internet and how that should be handled in public spaces. And a direct connection to the basketball field um, on the East End. And yeah, people having fun. Which brings me to the last project, which is the student precinct and student pavilion at University of Melbourne. Um, the student, well, I went to University of Melbourne. It was fun and it's actually a really well known uh, rated uh, research university um, and known for its research and academic reputation. It has an enrollment of over 52,000 students uh, and growing and students generally live off campus with limited access to study and recreational space. The pavilion is part of the ambitious 250,000 square foot student precinct plan to improve the on-campus student experience. The precinct offers, will offer arts and culture venues, student study space, recreation and social amenities and food. So let me sort of give you the lay of the land. Downtown Melbourne, which is a great place, is here. This is Swanson Street that connects up into Carlton, which is the name of the neighborhood. When we were at university, we lived over here. Um, you can see I'm sentimental about this. Um, and then the core of the campus, which has like many universities spread into the neighborhood of Carlton around it. And here's the student precinct, which was made up of a bunch of different buildings um, and some were to be retained and some were needed to be built new. So here's the team. So this was a sort of a diversity procurement model for design services. It brought firms with, firms with varied backgrounds and interests together to mirror the diversity of the student body. Makes a lot of sense. Building design is individual as you would expect in a diversity model. And, and site design is seen as a collective. So what you have here is people whose focus is in sustainability, breathe architecture. Um, NMBW, which is an emerging firm in Melbourne. We were considered the foreigners, or I took exception to that, but we were a foreign firm. And then behind here, which uh, was a, uh, an Aboriginal-led firm, 
and also a uh, now I've forgotten who the other ones are without my little cues. And there were two landscape firms. This was really a consortium of spirits and lions was our sort of, uh, their name suits them, was our big advocate that brought the team together. And uh, it was a fantastic experience. The landscape that you're seeing, uh, the, that rolls through the site and into the buildings to the north, um, Foregrounds a contribution of indigenous people by making the pre-colonial landscape visible. Um, I don't have a picture, I should have had one, that shows you how chopped up this landscape was and how, um, how awful. Um, what's most important though, is that the, this sort of move reflects a general consciousness raising about reconciliation with Aboriginal peoples that is happening in Australia, which I hope will similarly extend here with Native Americans. For example, these days, all events begin with the welcome to country, an introduction that highlights the cultural significance of the surrounding area to a particular Aboriginal clan or language group who are recognised as traditional owners of the land. How beautiful is that? And how needed? So we're zooming in and that landscape is roaring north. There were two new buildings to be built, um, arts and culture and student pavilion. It's not really a surprise that the student pavilion came our way. Um, it, was the most, it, it was the most informal of the buildings. It's kind of the neighborhood building. And it comprises a food hall on the ground level that opens out to the outside. Um, a retreat rooftop for events and relaxation, study space, and a recreational library, the Road and White Library, that is, that is recreational because you are not allowed to study there. Now, it was a place that I have a strong affection for in its current location. It was a great place to go listen to LPs and uh, smoke a little dope. So now that you're going to YouTube, you're gonna edit that for me, thank you. Oh, dope is legal. See, I live in the past. And threading through those spaces are these expressionist columns that can collect all of these programs together. So sort of looking at it north-south, columns aren't so visible. As you move east-west, they become more apparent. There's a cladding with glass, uh, black butt sustainably harvested wood, and it's now in construction. Student survey responses conveyed interest in sustainability and the design response to that. But first I'll just walk you through the program. So there's the ground floor, the food hall with a bunch of vendor uh, pods added in. Um, the second and third floor that divide vertically, one side the road and white library on the other side study. And then the rooftop, which is kind of like a big summer house with outdoor um, recreational space. And that's for events and more study. I mean, as we know, study doesn't happen in a designated study space um, and the variety of seating and places uh, for people to choose how they want to study and, and do their work either singly or together is very, very important. So reflecting the interests of students, the character of the student pavilion is much more about a natural setting in this very urban campus. It provides more visibility of sustainable materials, and more vi visibility of environmental stewardship through reduced carbon footprint and renewables. The whole student precinct is shooting for uh, lead platinum uh, with the equivalent of what we would call here lead platinum. And you can see how this plays out. It's kind of an aviary on the outside with outdoor spaces, which is new to the university. They've never allowed students to have outdoor spaces before above ground level. And then the West End, which is kind of an expression of inclusivity and welcome, making it really clear that this building belongs to the students and they can use every part of it. The connection to the arts and culture building to the West. The sustainability sort of section that shows the approach to uh, thermal comfort, mixed mode for the food hall so it can open up in, in good weather. And similarly for the recreation event floor, and then uh, more energy used for uh, this 
the uh, informal study and road and white library space in, in, the, in between. Looking into the road and white library, elevator on the left, the informal study space. Oops. And looking from the south, which is the shady side where, uh, where I come from, um, to a building that we hope will provide a heart for the student precinct and something that the students will feel is theirs. Um, I really enjoyed presenting sort of point of view about neighborhood today and I kind of kept it short and I hope you have a lot of questions and I really do thank you for inviting me and uh, yeah, let, let's get on with uh, some interaction. It feels so weird sitting here with no noise from anybody. All right, thank I'm going to applaud for you, Julie. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, and why don't you help yourself to a drink of water? Um, so I just want to say one quick thing before we go into Q&A, which is the next lecture is on Thursday, June 3rd. Um, it's a Thursday. I just want to make sure we get people because it, it throws them off. Usually we, um, we are, we're usually on Wednesdays, but June 3rd is the next one. Um, with Laura Crescomano from uh, SiteLab Urban Studio. So I, that was incredible. And, you know, I'm so grateful that you you spent so much time focusing on the ground plane, no matter what the project is. Um, you know, obviously the theme of the, of the series is uh, the public realm. And it's clear to me that no matter what the program of your project or the scale, you're you're really trying to activate um, the public realm around the project and inside the project as much as possible. So I think you double the value at least. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I love that you think of the projects as neighborhoods, not buildings, and, and that you show people in all of your photos. That's something I try to do also. Um, the activation of the shared space indoors and outdoors is so critical to the success of your projects. How do you typically develop an outdoor program um, and a ground floor program with, with your clients? Um, sometimes I don't know to ask for it, um, but it's part of our DNA at this point because I think we're fascinated by the idea of how you make connections. I mean, we know this idea of sticky space in, is sort of in, uh, become a sort of a, a check for us. How are we making a resonant reaction to the context we're in. I mean, we were, used, we were trained to believe that you were meant to fit into a context. You remember those days? Yep. And uh, that's absolutely not what you should do. You need to act on a context and deliver something that makes that context stronger while you make your building stronger as well. And that has, it sounds like it's all physical, but it's actually got a social, um, uh, what do you call it, outcome that, that's tied to it because it means people engage with the place that they're in rather than retreat within another a place that you've made. Do you, do you ever go back to these projects after a year or two and, and check yeah. in with the residents? And you know, I, I'm big into post-occupancy evaluation. I always ask a question about this, um, but even informally just kind of do interviews with folks that are um, especially living in the, the affordable housing projects. Well, the affordable housing was the most, uh, what do you call it? Illuminating. So we do go back and do informal uh, interviews and we do have people who get very involved with the projects who keep sort of going there and fixing things or adding things after they don't really need to do that. So they end up building relationships with, with tenants and tenants tell you some really interesting stuff. So we are all incredibly frustrated that although the budgets for housing were so tight, the requirements for bathroom size to, to meet accessibility, which is critical, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing it, meant that the bathrooms were huge. And we thought, well, can't, this is kind of a waste. It would be so great to give it to them in the living space. So then this one guy says to us, well, I never thought I'd have a hotel bathroom. And what you've done by accident is give people a sense of dignity beyond what you thought you could do. Another weird one was doorbells. Another frustration where the city said, you need to put doorbells on these units. It's like, what a, what a waste of money. It's one room, it's a studio, right? Knock on the door. 
Right, right. But the lady in that unit said it felt like it was hers because it had a doorbell. So it's amazing how much we don't know and how much we can learn from just listening. It's, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. And those kind of anecdotes make a huge difference. We went back to the library. Actually, Nathan um, has been making a little movie for the AIA about uh, the Pico Branch Library. And we went back and tried to sort of talk to people as we were designing the project and how it's being used now. And it's, it's very heartwarming how much it's been taken into the community. So these strategies work. I mean, I can tell you stories of where we thought we'd done something great and it wasn't, but I, I'll focus on the ones where it's a success. Oh no, I wanna hear the bad stuff too. No, 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 I can't do it right. now. I'm in a All good right. mood. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, so much about affordable housing is, is dignity, restoring yeah. dignity to people's lives. And I, that's, that's an anecdote that says to me, you're succeeding on that front. Um, people wanna know about your colors. You're, you're using a lot of white for, you know, the main volumetric moves, but um, you're infusing these striking oranges and greens. And where is that coming from? And is it site specific? Um, is it site specific? Well, I think color is spatial. So we generally use it to create a sense of contrast that creates more spatial effect. Um, and I don't know. If you're talking about groupings of things, it's only a convention that says white is not a color and orange and green is a color. It's just one kind of color. And it's probably, it's playing on cultural norms to energize a space. What I do recommend, if you really wanna see use of color is go down to Melbourne, Australia, where the architects there are not at least bit concern about what conventions of color are. And there are riotous and wonderful uh, combinations. So maybe I'll say it's because I'm from Australia, but. <laughs> well, I think, so, I think Southern California is also a lot more comfortable experimenting with color and, you know. Oh, I, whoa, whoa, go to the mission. Yeah, that, that's true. It's, well, it's, I think we've all forgotten this incredible Spanish heritage that came with all these vibrant colors that live next to each other and still exists in the Mission and other old San Francisco neighborhoods. Palo Alto is pretty white bread, Yeah, but go north. Well, my, my friend's young daughter texted, why doesn't Stanford have uh, buildings with these bold colors? Because I love them, so. Uh, we'll tell her she's right. <laughs> I, we're going to have to build an orange building soon. I'm sure yes, Dave is going to love that. Um, Thank you for paying homage to Andrew Carnegie and his philanthropy. Um, I, I went to Carnegie Mellon University, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm biased, but it's, it's a great story that you told everybody tonight before that project. And uh, you even pronounced his name correctly. You said Carnegie, which is everyone in Pittsburgh is going to be really happy about that. Um, the Children's Museum is so striking and different from your other work. You know, you described it as a beautiful ruin. Um, and that idea of sort of showcasing and highlighting the uh -huh. uh, dilapidated parts, you know, um, versus the completely preserved parts is just such a beautiful aesthetic move. Was that from you? Was it in combination with the client and the, the end users? Where did that idea come from? Um, we didn't start out with that idea because, as I said, we had hoped that so that outside of the building, as we said, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. But the inside had been remodeled and damaged enough that it had not been put on the register. But we, our client is really interested and we agree with them that it's about roots and wings. So honoring the past is important. So to honor the community interest in the roots, we really wanted to do something that would pay homage to what was originally there. And we thought that we would be doing a much more simple sort of semi-restoration. It was only when we discovered the damage and how bad it was, that we realized there was no way that we could afford it. And that's when we went into exploration mode about what do we do with this stuff? We kept uncovering more and more things. And usually in projects, you have to design everything in advance make a decision and stick with it. This client group explore ideas and they like to work with people who explore ideas and they gave us a lot of room. And the idea of the ruin emerged because we all thought it was so beautiful. 
but then how do you justify it to a public who's used to seeing um, a clean and tidier buildings? And uh, in the end, we all felt brave enough that it was going to work. Um, and some donors were brought in to see what their reaction would be, because if we didn't have the donors, we couldn't do the project. And they were on board because they too were fascinated by what we found. And it was just so fitting to the uh, program um, that we, we basically saw an opportunity and ran with it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it actually feels like space that a child would feel comfortable making art in, right? And well, it's not only a child. See, what we were dealing with, too, is we're talking about teens. So children um, is one thing, but teens need a little edge. I mean, they're experimenting with the world. You don't want to do something that's really, really safe. That's not their world. Their world is to feel like they're finding new ideas, that they're exploring new things. And we were a little worried that because it was such a sober building, we wouldn't be able to do that. And I think that was another reward of the, uh, the beautiful ruin that uh, we were grateful for. Yeah, we have, we have a project. It reminds me of a, a small, much smaller project we have on campus at Stanford, which is the Peterson Laboratory, um, which was a historic building that got partially renovated. But yeah, I think you're right. I, I think the, the students on campus definitely appreciate something that doesn't feel quite so precious yeah. um, that they can take ownership of and they can you know, work in a design fashion that suits their process. And, and it's a generational shift um, to get away from the really precious space. I, I um, think we also have a fair, our firm has a very anti-authoritarian streak. And kind of one of the other rules of making resonant space is that you should make space where people feel like they can make a mess. Yep. I think it's a, it's, it's a giving of control. Yep, absolutely. And just anecdotally was, did it end up being more or less expensive, do you think, than if you had just gone precious throughout and just done a We could not have afforded to bring the ornament back. There was one plaster for plaster works firm left in Pittsburgh and to restore the column capitals to what they had been, which meant making casts and stuff and a lot of research, we could never have put that stuff back. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't an option. Oh, it, looks, it looks spectacular. Thank you. Um, a couple of people want to know, what was the inspiration behind the Pico Library roof profile? Uh, well, I know it, to me, that's kind of like a, a teenager that's grown too big for its body. That's part of it. And I've always loved that analogy. Others say it looks like uh, the, Holo uh, sorry, the Santa Monica Mountains that you can see on a clear day from the library. It really came about from an integrated design approach for daylight harvesting as I sort of described briefly in the talk. And if we could um, sculpt the ceiling to bring the light in without bringing the sunlight in, it meant that you could see into the building more. So I know we all do these drawings and I'm showing it here on the screen still, right? Um, where it's real easy to see in the building. It's real easy to see in a building at night. With the kind of glass we need to, to use these days on our budgets, it's not so easy to see into the glass, through the glass during the day. And the only way to do that is to add light on the inside. And there's no amount of um, artificial light that will do the same as daylight will on the inside of a building. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful sculptural, very minimalist composition. I really appreciate it. Um, one last one about materials and budget. So. Affordable housing is so challenging. You, mm -hmm. um, first of all, who are some of the, the clients you really like collaborating with on affordable housing? Skid Row Housing Trust, Community Corporation of Santa Monica. Um, what's interesting is um, both of these organizations started out in the 80s. So the federal government decided that, the, uh, that HUD, Housing and Urban Development, was kind of too socialistic providing housing to the masses, right, who needed it. So they disbanded uh, HUD's control over the creation of all of this affordable housing and set up instead funding for uh, neighborhood um, development corporations, which was actually a great thing because it meant we then we moved from uh, sort of uh, scale, projects of scale, like you've seen in, uh, in Chicago, they're the most notorious. Um, to infill projects. 
and it attracted a bunch of developers and uh, people who cared to reinvent what housing should be. And that happened in LA in the 80s. And we happened to get into affordable housing when that group of people represented by the, those are two good organizations who got into the business then. And uh, I think there was a lot of invention. And I think there has been in LA more invention in affordable housing than there has been in market rate housing. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little concerned about materiality on affordable housing long term. You know, I, I think you're you're doing spectacular stuff. You mentioned David Baker, who who does great stuff in our neck of the woods, and you know they're amazing. I, I'm a little bit nervous about how they're going to age over time. Do you have that kind of dialogue with your clients and try to just get them to spend a little bit more on the envelope ever? Well, so it depends on the developer. So Skid Row Housing Trust understood when you do a building that's downtown and the brightness of the white downtown makes a big difference because everything is sort of dreary and, and um, we use an acrylic plaster rather than a straight up uh, sand stucco plaster and that resists uh, accumulation. And they understood it because they're gonna hold on to the building because that's, that's affordable housing in perpetuity and that will happen. Other developers aren't thinking necessarily, other not-for-profit housing developers may not be thinking the same way, but I wish they would. Um, but uh, probably, and I think this is true, I would say that affordable housing generally is built better than uh, entry-level market rate housing, which yeah, is trying to uh, cater to the, um, the, lower budget end of the market, which is still really too high for everybody, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, we've got a project um, near Civic Center in San Francisco that David Baker did one side of the street affordable and one side of the street market rate. Yeah. And he joked that the only difference was the appliances in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, the corn shell costs were essentially the same. So it's it's a big social issue right now. And I'm, I'm glad people like you are solving it for all of us. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to ask Dave to come back into the room and take us home. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Um, Julie, you just infused so much energy into our little theme that we developed for this year. Um, I really want to thank you. The, the work um, really shows your compassion as well as your talent. Um, I got chills on that library interior lobby shot. I really did. Yeah, and I, 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 I just... Um, was thinking the same thing that somebody asked the question about how, how do you document what seems to be you almost had to have someone standing there day by day with the contractor as they unveiled what the next exposed column might look like and how do you document what you really want them to do. Um, it sounds like it needs as much attention as some of the low market the market rate housing or the, the below market rate housing um, to make it lovely. But uh, thank you for your time and for your passion and for addressing our theme so nicely tonight. Pleasure, enjoyed doing it. Great, thank you very much. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.